Uh, spoiler alert here, I'm giving away the plot of an old movie. Um, anyway, the original movie, uh, The Jackal, The Day of the Jackal, not the one with uh, Bruce Willis in it, but the one with Edward Fox in it, um, 1973, ostensibly a political-slash-terrorism thriller uh, about a plot to murder Charles de Gaulle to assassinate the president of France. Um, ostensibly, that's what it was. It was just a thriller. But really, if you ask me, it was a somewhat caricatured view of the awesome power, to us, uh, wielded by the French state. Um, in the movie, uh, there's torture, there's kidnapping, uh, eavesdropping, blackmail, uh, all kinds of things, nasty business engaged in by the government, the French government, in order to deal with a threat to its existence, a threat by right-wing, extreme right-wing terrorists to assassinate the president. Well, uh, here comes the plot-blowing bit. They succeed. The, um, the, uh, the jackal is uh, dealt with, removed, and uh, the people who are attempting to deal with him um, just sort of go on with their lives after that. That's the implication. Uh, the movie was made in 1973, and by that point people knew that the French had more or less gotten a little bit fed up with Charles de Gaulle and had sort of dropped him, um, kind of in a dignified sort of way. But the 1960s was even more of a stormy period for France than it was for the U.S. The Algerian War and the fallout from that was far nastier than the Vietnam War and its fallout. Now, when you have things like um, a credible existential threat to the, the state, to the republic, the government, whatever, what do you do about that? What, when you have uh, serious enemies attempting to undermine uh, your society, what do you do? Well, in The Jackal, again, The Jackal was something of a caricature. The people who actually were doing the nasty things, who were doing the torturing, who were doing the kidnapping, who were doing the, uh, uh, the infiltration and uh, all kinds of horrible things, were working on behalf of the democratically and constitutionally elected government of France. They got their hands filthy dirty in uh, the uh, course of dealing with the threat to the French state, which was real. Um, they also, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Interior uh, is uh, is a, assumed to have almost unlimited power. At one point, they bugged the entire cabinet. Now, if you're bugging your own cabinet ministers, who can't you bug? But anyway, the implication is that, and these are implications that are actually serious uh, and relevant even today, are that sometimes this is necessary, and if the right people do it for the right reasons, the end result is better than possible outcomes. Now, this was going on in 1967 or 68. That's when the book was supposedly taking place, I believe. And within living memory were the 1930s. And what had happened when democratic governments behaved in a more or less spineless manner when dealing with serious existential threats from the extreme right, or in some cases, the extreme left. If the German government of the 1930s had shown equal resolution and, one might say, equal ruthlessness, uh, then maybe Hitler might not have risen to power. Um, again, this is not a cut-and-dried sort of thing, but you're sort of left with the sort of uneasy feeling that the good guys won in the Day of the Jackal, even though their methods were nothing short of horrific. This is why I think that morality and politics aren't necessarily a very good fit, um, or ethics, definitely, and politics are not a very good fit. Politics is about power, and ultimately, the politicians are the ones who decide what to do with the army. Um, send them into Iraq, or you don't send them into Iraq. And either way, maybe there are serious consequences to your own country. Send them into Afghanistan, or don't send them into Afghanistan. Um, either way, your decision might bring about more harm than good. 
let's say, for example, that George Bush decided not to send the U.S. military into Afghanistan after 9-11. Okay, that might seem to have been a laudable thing to do at the time, but it could have been seen, let's say, as a green light to anyone to attack any Western country for any reason because the, the people aren't going to do anything about it. So these decisions are not so easily made, and the Day of the Jackal illustrates this perfectly. Um, and again, it's telling that this took place in France because, as I say, it kind of overstated the, the power that the French government actually does have, but in a way that was sort of just meant to jar English, uh, the English-speaking audience. It was an English movie with mostly British actors. Um, the French government has enormous power uh, compared to most other governments in the Western world, or at least most other governments that aren't in continental Europe. But the powers that the French government has enables it to weather storms. I mentioned before that I believe that France wouldn't have been so badly shaken by 9-11 as the United States was, even Canada was. Um, but by the same token, something gets lost when you completely abandon idealism. As I say, I think that the French are idealist in a certain way. Um, they're idealistic about their political system, even though they are extremely cynical about the people that are <laughs> it's that their political system is meant to govern. Um, and they don't get quite so shocked when pretty shocking things happen uh, as we do in the English-speaking world. Security versus freedom. It's a never-ending debate. Um, but because of the fact that the French Republic was born and has always lived in the shadow of serious existential threats means that the French have engaged in the, this kind of a debate for much longer than we have in the English-speaking world. Um, the British Isles have this lovely anti-tank ditch or moat called the English Channel to render them not immune from invasion but more secure than most other European countries and well we in North America have the North Atlantic Ocean rendering invasion virtually impossible. Uh, France has uh, well powerful people on all of its borders and in right before the, first, uh, the Second World War they had fascist states on three of their borders France, Italy and Spain. But still their democracy survived until it was overthrown from outside by military invasion. Can you balance these things? Can you balance morality and politics? Um, I think that one has no choice but to do that because one of the main things that you've got to prevent in any democracy is paranoia and hysteria. Uh, the French Revolution is a good case of what happens when you let hysteria take over, or at least the reign of terror. So they learned from that. We've got to make sure that the government at least has the power to act and does not fall prey to hysteria. How do you prevent hysteria from taking place? You prepare for the worst, which means, of course, uh, a powerful army, um, a strong police apparatus to deal with internal threats like we saw in the Day of the Jackal, and um, the uh, courts with sufficient authority to deal with things, to deal with uh, uh, such internal threats as come about. Now, a lot of French people are not comfortable with, with what happened in their country in the 1960s, and to a certain extent, the wounds opened by the Algerian War are just starting to heal. Um, I'm not saying that it's a simple thing, that... that that getting your hands filthy and deciding that, well, we're just, those of us who are promoting democracy, believe in democracy and the Republican freedom and everything, are going to be just as ruthless and vicious as the people who are threatening it. But I will say that when you're sitting there in power and you're living in the real world and you see these situations taking place, you have to ask yourself, what do I do about this? Well, let's say, which I believe is inevitable, um, what are we going to do when the next 9-11 happens? The situation is upon us. We don't like it. Now what do we do? Do we have the tools to weather the storm? Or 
uh, do we simply fall prey to um, hysteria, paranoia, and navel gazing simply because we've never really allowed ourselves to think that far in, a, in advance, to think of the implications of living in a world in which there are credible existential threats to our rights and freedoms. So, ethics and politics, morality and politics, morality and democracy, ethics and democracy really, are a tough fit, or a difficult fit, because the whole point of democracy, presumably, is to do the right thing and to have a better society to live in. How do you end up, how do you do a better society when, uh, uh, when you're engaging in things like torture? Um, it, it seems insane that someone would actually even discuss that, at least in the Anglosphere, I suppose. Um, but then people will write post, what do you do when there's a real threat? McCarthyism, I think, is something that hangs over the Americans a lot more than they realize. And in the McCarthy period, there was a witch hunt for a threat that didn't exist. There were a few communists out there, but they really they didn't have the authority to, or the power to do anything. They were, there was just no way the United States was ever going to become a communist state. Um, but the American public believed that that was possible, so they empowered Mr. McCarthy to kind of be their hard man, their version of the, the tough guardians of French democracy um, that we saw in the day of the jackal. Well, the problem was there was no actual threat in the United States, whereas there was a real threat in France in the 1960s. That's kind of the touching point, isn't it? That's kind of the, the, the important point there. There has to be a real threat. But the problem is, of course, who gets to decide whether or not the threat is real? Thank you.